These are just a few of the trophies I've helped my grandchildren win over the past few years in their local competitions using the techniques I'll show you in this video. While there are many different classifications of Pinewood Derby cars based primarily on the number of wheels that are allowed and how much work is allowed on each wheel to change its shape, they can all be grouped into two basic types, the straight runner and the rail rider. A straight runner car is designed so that it runs straight down the track with a minimum amount of wiggling back and forth. A rail runner is fundamentally different. It is designed so that the uh, one of the front wheels actually runs along the side of the rail and keeping it pinned like that so it doesn't wiggle back and forth. The idea is that the amount of drag it experiences by running against the rail is less than the amount of energy lost as the car wiggles as in a straight runner car. Rail runner cars are faster than straight runner cars. This has been proven in many national championships, but they have one weakness, and that is that the track they run on has to be maintained by someone who understands both the cars and the track to make sure that all of the transitions from one section of the, of the track to the other are perfect. If they're not, and the wheel that's rubbing against the center rail hits a, uh, a defect, so, for example, a uh, transition between two sections of the track that aren't perfectly aligned, the wheel can be nicked, the car can be thrown out of alignment, and actually ejected from the track and destroyed. Uh, for that reason, since most local pack type Pinewood Derby races uh, have uh, tracks that are not as well maintained as they should be, this video will focus on cars that are designed to be straight runner cars so that uh, you don't have to worry about uh, hitting a, a defect in the center rail as much. When it comes to Pinewood Derby race car, physics determines the shape. You want as little wood or as little weight in the body as possible so you can concentrate all of the weight about an inch in front of the rear wheels so that it has as much weight as high as possible so it accelerates the car down the ramp to the greatest possible speed. You also, for a straight running car, want the weight to be concentrated in as small an area as possible so that the mass moment of inertia be as small as possible so when the car veers off it takes as little rubbing on the center rail as possible to get it to come back to straight. That means you need to use a tungsten disc, which is available from almost any uh, Pinewood uh, Derby cars. Uh, you can use a lead disc, either by making it larger in diameter or taller, but both of those options have negatives. If you make it larger in diameter, the mass moment of inertia goes up quite quickly and you can lose quite a bit of time. I'm talking on the order of 50 thousandths of a second. If you make it taller, you have more aerodynamic drag, the uh, center of mass is up higher, and both of those are not good for high speeds. To keep the moment of inertia, or the amount of energy it needs to, take, uh, to turn a, a car straight once it's gone off track, uh, you need to minimize the diameter of the weights you use and you just can't do any better than the um, one inch diameter tungsten discs uh, that are available online from various uh, Pinewood Derby suppliers. These typically weigh uh, 92 to 93 grams and if you trim your car down as light as possible this isn't enough weight. What you need to do is supplement it and the most aerodynamic way to do that is with a dome. This is a uh, 29 gram dome, which works well to supplement the weight of the tungsten disc. 
So when it's in, when they uh, when this is inserted to the car and this is epoxy back on top of it, it creates a very aerodynamic, very low mass moment of inertia weight, which is just about optimal for Pinewood Derby cars that run straight. The problem with making a lead dome like this is that it's very dangerous. You have to melt the lead and then pour it into a mold. This is not something I recommend anyone doing. However, uh, if you feel it's necessary, please, by all means, use all appropriate safety equipment and have adult supervision and uh, just be as careful as you can. Lead is hot, lead is poisonous. But even if you do everything right, you've got a problem. Let's say you make a, a mold for the dome and you pour the lead into it. What's going to happen is because the lead has such a high surface tension, instead of getting a flat surface here, you're going to get a dome. It's going to have like a, a two domes, the one you want and the one you don't want. And the reason you don't want that is that when you go to uh, glue the, uh, your dome onto your car, you're going to have to use a lot of material to fill in that, that uh, curve that you don't want. One way to get around that is that you pour your lead into the mold, and you'll have to do it a couple times, by the way, to drive out all the moisture. First couple times uh, you do it, the moisture in the wood is going to be driven out, and you're going to get bubbles on the surface of your, uh, of your lead. Pour your lead in, which I will simulate with this, and then use a piece of wood dowel, and while the lead is still molten, molten tap it down, so that you get a perfectly flat bottom to your dome. A great Pinewood Derby car starts with a great block of wood. This is an example of a very poor piece of wood. And the reason is that the grain lines are at a sharp angle to the side of the car into which you'll be drilling your axle holes. What happens is because these lines of grain are harder than the rest of the wood, as the drill penetrates, it is actually bent and turned slightly downward. So your axle hole ends up at a slight angle. Because the grain extend, uh, varies down the length of the block, each axle hole will also be at a slightly different and unpredictable angle. Another problem with this block of wood is that the grain lines are very far apart. That means this wood was formed when the tree was growing very rapidly. When the grain is far apart like this, it's much more prone to warpage. This is an example of a great block of wood. First of all, the grain lines are very close together. This wood was formed when the tree was growing very slowly. This means that it is much less likely to warp once you've cut out the car. Additionally, the lines of grain are almost perpendicular to the side into which you'll be drilling your axle holes, which means there's nothing to deflect the drill as it penetrates. Another reason this is a great piece of wood is that when I measure the width at both ends, they're exactly the same to within a thousandth of an inch. The reason that's important is that if there's a slight taper what that means is, is as you drill your axle holes, they're going to be slightly angled towards each other, like that and like that. And that's like a skier snow plowing down the side of the mountain. Those opposing angles will cause the car to drag slightly and slow it down. If you get a good block like this that does have a slight taper, what you can do to fix that is put a piece of tape on the thin end on each side so that the distance, I mean the width at one end is the same as the other. That way when you rest it on your drilling block the sides will be uh, parallel to each other. I drill my axle holes using a wood jig that's been aligned using shims and adjusting the table angle so that the surface of the block is perpendicular to the axis of the drill to within a third of one degree. To do this, I drill test holes 
and then using a brass rod, which I have made sure is perfectly straight, I insert it in the hole, and then using a good right angle plastic, uh, measure the angle here to make sure that this is 90 degrees, and against the bottom face here to make sure that the distance is the same all the way up, and that ensures that this is perpendicular. I make several measurements, pulling the rod out and putting it back in to make sure that uh, the rod hasn't bent and I'm getting uh, spurious um, angles. Once I'm sure that the drill bit is perpendicular to the surface, I line up my block and very slowly drill a hole so that it doesn't uh, accidentally hit a hard part of the wood and get knocked crooked. It usually takes me 30 seconds or more to drill a single hole. Doing it this way is time consuming and tedious. It can take over an hour to get the uh, drilling jig perfectly aligned. But when I'm done, I'm sure that that hole, which is going to hold the axle, is as perpendicular to this surface as it's possible to get.